water is only an adjunct therapy. We do it when nothing else works. So let's see whether we can have a mind shift to see that it can be used as a standalone, that in itself, it is wonderful therapy. Yep, so I just let that screen there so you could read for yourself some of the things I did. Okay, so why aquatics? When we talk about why aquatics, many times we go, oh yeah, the first thing that comes often to mind is range of motion, tone, balance, coordination, then strength, tongue, trunk control. But some of the things that are often forgotten or sidelined are things like motor planning, oral motor work. Wow, what has it got to do with our mouth? Sensory processing, body awareness, the developing choice making. And one of the things that we see a lot is respiration and stamina. Respiration also because of the water, you're using a lot of that space in between the ribs for muscle strength. So like I said earlier, there's a common belief that aquatic therapy is merely a junk therapy. But what happens if we just change that for a little bit and view it as essential? Perhaps even stand alone as part of a multidisciplinary program. Because the aquatic environment offers freedom of movement. You can move anywhere in the water and everywhere. Nothing holds you. So why would this be so? So in the water, there's lack of stability because it allows for different and um, changing, changing movements. If you just think about the effects of water, that water is constantly moving. The only time water is still is if it's frozen. And I'm not kidding you that. But for example, turbulence. So you have got that movement in the water. So the person that's in the water is always constantly moving. Just think a very involved child. They have no opportunity of that three-dimensional movement on land. They're either stuck in a wheelchair or on a plinth or on the floor or in a seating system. There's only very little movement that their body can do. But if you have them in the water, in the water which is constantly moving, they have opportunity to at least experience this. And well, we all start life in water. So it's also very nurturing, but of course temperature is an important factor here. So if you've got temperature of the pool that is thermal neutral, that um, is really comfortable. Very often we see children, young adults feeling really comfortable and they're able to just let go. Now, one concept that um, when I did my training with Andrea Saltzman from ATU was the concept of the invisible plinth because water is supporting. If you think about it, water supports you from everywhere. So you've got the support, yet you have excess top, sides, bottom. You can get all round the child that's in the water. So that's really, that was a wonderful take home from me, for me because really opening that whole thing to, that's true, I can do it all. So, we come back to understanding the properties of water. Yep. So, yeah, sorry, let me change that. Oops. Okay. So, what makes that possible in the water? So, again, the first thing when people talk about water, oh, yeah, buoyancy. So, what is buoyancy? Buoyancy is up thrust, what pushes you up. Now, Often people think in terms of being in the water, it's gravity free. The only time something is gravity free is if you're in outer space. But we are on earth and there's still that gravity pull that pulls you down. So you've got gravity pulling you down, you have buoyancy pushing you up. So this is a wonderful property where they two fight against each other and in many different ways, you can use that therapeutically. 
Then there's the hydrostatic pressure. That's the pressure that comes all around you. So the hydrostatic pressure, if you're at the same depth, it's equal all round. It changes as you go deeper. The um, pressure, of course, is more. However, the force that comes around at the deeper depth is still the same. So it's like that big hug that you get in the water. Viscosity, something we often forget about, that's the friction of uh, the molecules of liquid because molecules of liquid um, is different from molecules of air. So it's that texture, the resistance and the friction of the molecules of water. And that is what causes that flow in the water, that resistance, how you move. My all-time favorite, flow and drag. So water, it can flow in a streamlined manner or it can flow in a turbulent uh, manner. So one can go um, further into detail, but in 20 minutes, I'm not going to do that. There's just so much. But this is really nice because you can change the shape that the body has in the water merely by using flow and drag. Then there's surface tension. When you come out of the water and when you stay in the water and that movement coming out and going back. So that when you break the surface, the tension changes because you've also got the air molecules and the water molecules that are working together. Refraction, which is the change um, of the, um, in direction of a light wave. Um, I never gave so much attention to this in all honesty until I actually looked at pictures of myself in the water and I had to laugh because really I had this big monster foot and I had this big foot and it just looked like I had two toes and hey that's me but that's what it looks like in the water and when you think about people who don't have um, very good vision a lot of challenges visually this can really really be a big part of their program either good or bad but it does play an important part in where they are, their own body awareness as well. Thermal shifts, of course, it's um, when you're coming into the water, there is a change in, um, uh, in energy, uh, the heat when you're coming in, going out. So this is also uh, an important factor, especially so if you have um, indications uh, sensory processing uh, problems that uh, can pose sometimes challenges there. So, well, who can do aquatherapy? Almost anyone. I think there is no such thing as they're too involved that they can't do it. However, having said that, there are also precautions and there are also contraindications. So precautions allow for the therapist's discretion to treat or not to treat. Contraindications mean a person is absolutely not allowed in the pool and there are no exceptions. At the end of the day, some places there is a very long list of precautions and a shorter list of contraindications. Other places, there's an equally long list of contraindications. So I think when it comes to this, the rule of thumb should be you need to keep your patient safe, work within your limits and your knowledge, and you need to see what the facility can offer. If the facility is very basic, doesn't have the support that you may need, then you need to also think twice, can I keep my patient safe or not? Yeah, so the list is um, extensive. I think this is something that um, you need to go through in your facility with the management as well and with all the other therapists um, that you have. Yeah, so we take almost everyone in the water. Um, 
with um, seizures and um, things like that, but we are very careful. So labels, we all say we hate labels. Ah, oh, don't label us. But you'd still need those labels because you need to find a baseline, a starting point. So this is also useful information for your understanding. But with this comes the danger of preconceptions and generalizations. So while we still need to know, uh, it's also important that the focus should be on the child. And like Anat, um, and in fact, Debbie also just said, um, what's important is one has to focus on the can-do, not on their weaknesses, on their abilities. And sometimes some of the abilities may seem like very little. We often have parents when we want to take the child in the water, all they can talk about is what they cannot do. And I think it's good if we had a starting point of what they can do. Sometimes the fact that they want to come into the water for me is a great can do starting point that, whoa, they're ready to come in. So this is all good and fine, but we need to start somewhere. So having a therapeutic program, these are good starting points. Um, in our facility, I'm sure it's in many other facilities as well. We work very closely with the land-based therapists as well. So um, we try to have a program that um, really merges synchronizes very well with what they do on land base. Uh, so we like the aquatic participation because it's a nice base for good motor skills. And in the beginning, I did say because using the properties of the water, there's a lot of movement that goes in the water. So there's a lot of opportunity and potential for experience for building your motor skills. And of course, we see plenty, plenty of opportunity for progression, moving forward, building up these skills. I've said it before, I'll say it again. We need to focus on the strengths to overcome weaknesses. If all we can think about is what cannot be done or often I can't do anything on land, let's put them in water which was actually my starting point with my son. We can't do anything, let's try the water. And it's also a good point to remember that there is no recipe book version for anyone because no one size fits all. And every child has their own unique needs. So we need to honor these unique needs. But when we have a lot of tools in our toolkit, this is where we can pull them out and see what works for, for Johnny, for Mary. They might all be different things. Yeah, so it comes down to we can't forget assessments. If there are no assessments, then where's our baseline? Where's our starting point? So the assessments, I believe, should also align with the parents' goals. Um, many templates for assessments are available and can be used. However, I think an assessment ultimately is also about collection of information through observation. In our facility, we do both a land-based assessment as well as a water assessment. So it always starts with the physios doing a land base and then moving into the pool to do a water base. Uh, assessments and um, the documentation that follow for these should also be related to therapeutic goals. So we need to find that baseline. Where is my child at now? And of course, that is always changing. What are the future goals that we're looking at? Measurable outcome. I really want that all the time because um, sometimes the parent so badly wants to see something that they see it. Now, don't forget, I wear two hats. I'm also a parent of a hurt child. 
So I often need to be reeled in by my therapist when it comes to my own child. But if I can see a measurable outcome, I can see statistics, um, I think it's a little bit better there that uh, this is. And of course, that also will help us to move towards progression because we don't want to always be stuck at the same place. So different aquatic uh, techniques, there are so many out there. Um, I personally started with Watsu because I had a very, very involved son. Um, I will later show you some um, slides because he has given me permission to share. Um, that was uh, very good for us. Then there is the Badragas ring method, Halliwick, Aichi, PNF, um, and there's unpredictable command techniques. There's a there's an echo. What's happening? You know? No? Okay, I'll move on. So, what is Watsu? Um, it was developed in the US by the late Harold Dahl, and it's a series of passive stretches. So, basically, the therapist does everything. And um, the sequences are structured. It's prog it progresses, but if you're looking at it from a therapeutic point of view, you may not be doing all of them in a sequence. It's also based on the ability of um, the person that is in your arms. And most of the time, they will be in the arms. So weight is reduced from the spine and the extremities and that enhances a lot of relaxation and weightlessness. So here, it's a little bit easier to achieve range of le different uh, levels with your range of motion, uh, often beyond what can be achieved on land and where, where we are working against the forces of gravity. So in this picture here, in Watsu terms, it's very simple. It's called rotating accordion. But if you want to break it down in physio language, it's the bilateral repetitive lower extremity rotational flexor extensor pattern. I'll go with rotating or accordion. But there is a space for this in the therapy arena. And a lot of studies recently have been done. And I think one was just recently published um, end of last year in Switzerland on this. There's the Badragas uh, ring method, which was developed um, in Germany by a physician, Knupfer, and brought to the thermal spas in Switzerland by Ibsen. Uh, all this happened in the late 50s and in the 60s, we had Brigitte uh, Davis and Beatrice Egger. They started incorporating the PNF patterns in this. So it's often used for active stabilization, but one can also use it for passive stretches. So in Badraga's ring method, there is a ring to support the neck. There is one, uh, there's usually a ring around the um, ASIS and also at the ankles, yeah? So, they follow the principles of PNF where one can work on spiral diagonal movements. And this is often used for muscle re-education and strengthening, spinal elongation, relaxation, pain relief. There's um, soft tissue compliance, tone reduction. I, in honesty, use it a little bit less with my uh, CP um, clients because a lot of the time we have to work together and more an adapted um, Badragas ring method is what I would be using. There's Halliwick, which um, I am, uh, is very close to my heart, uh, developed in the 50s by a fluid engineer, James McMillan. And this was originally developed to teach children with CP how to swim and for them to experience freedom in the water. 
So it focuses on the principles of motor control and develops a sense of balance. So it's very structured because it goes through 10 points that one goes through um, in a very organized manner. But it's not a question of tick point one, tick point two, tick point three. You may at a certain level tick point one, tick point two, and then realize you have to go back to point one again. But it's all done in a very organized way, so very progressive. So the child that comes in the water is mentally adjusted and ready to experience the water ready to let go a little bit and ready to start working on progressing their motor control and what i love about this is the rotations that go uh, with this because a lot of our movement depends on rotations in our body um, you need to turn to open something you need to rotate when you walk you need rotation you need to have um, an association with your shoulder and the opposite hip so a lot of these things are possible in the 10 point um, program so the physical properties of the water are used and it is very very joyous because a lot is done through games songs group work though some of the time we do have to work on a one-to-one -one. um the picture that you see on the screen this is a little boy with um cerebral palsy he initially had um a lot of difficulty with breathing and closing his mouth and what i like about this he didn't know i'm chatting with his mom keeping a little lookout for him and he's starting to play on his own and feeling his body and you know she quickly took pictures of this and we thought wow this is great and this was after a therapy session so when he was able to feel and experience things in his body he was ready to start trying them out there's Aichi uh, which was developed in Japan by Jun Kono very structured program I tend to use it for my older uh, CP clients. We don't use all, we use some of it. And um, I use it a lot actually for breath work and for memory and for awareness of the body movements. So flotation devices. So this is something that um, I feel very strongly about. I think it's also my training with Halliwick. We do use some flotation devices. We use a big flotation mat in the pool for kids to climb up on. We use it a lot in our aquatic sensory integration programs. I use a lot of noodles. What I don't use at all are armbands. I use sometimes a neck float not often because I am a little bit concerned of traction, but there are reasons why we don't use it. So we are looking at rotations in the water. So if you have a flotation device, that's prevented. You can't do that and they cannot experience it because they are stuck in that one position. Because they may have... Um, as, as an example spasticity so because of that in their body they may have some unwanted rotations now if you have a float on they are not able to control they're not able to use their own body their own muscle their brain to um stop the unwanted rotation so it goes either way they're not adaptable so if you're an instructor and you are giving support, note I don't use the word hold, support, you can vary, you can adjust how much you want to give to suit that person's individual needs. You can decide, I need to give more, I need to back off. But because you maintain that connection with the child, sometimes it's so subtle. So you know when to drop the support, when to come back up gently, subtly, to give them the experience and opportunity to progress. Um, 
Breath is very important when you're in the water, great for speech as well. So if you've got flotation um, aids, more often than not, you're above the level of the water and you can't work on blowing and work on breath control. A lot of the time, the head is kept up and often is a little bit like a lordotic position where it out, you've got the tortoise neck that sticks out. So it could result in learning poor posture and um, might be harder to learn good body control and good body positioning. Because if you don't feel it in your body, you're not going to know. And if you are doing something that is not great for your posture, you practice makes perfect. And then you become very, very good at learning poor posture. So also people which are reliant on equipment of, on land, you don't want them to have equipment again in the water. You want them to be able to experience the freedom, the concept of having three-dimensional movement, that invisible plinth, nothing under you. And of course, you have the problem of over-dependence. So um, in conclusion, there is really something for everybody. At every level, you can find something but you need to understand the principles of the water. Um, in my facility, I have eight physios and one occupational therapist. And I always tell them when they are being trained that the water is the therapist. Understand what the water can do for you. You merely facilitate. And remember your own body mechanics, because as a practitioner, you're in the water, you cannot hurt yourself. Work within your capabilities and comfort levels, and most of all, enjoy what you're doing. Now, I put this picture here, which was taken last month. When I say there's something for everyone, that's my husband behind there who has a uh, water phobia. He's terrified of the water because he doesn't swim, and he is now doing his rehab program for total knee rehab. And there's, of course, Amir trying to teach, that's my son, trying to teach his daddy what he can do. And you can see it's joyous. They're having fun doing it. So how good is aquatic therapy? I want to show you these uh, pictures. I'll go quickly through it. So here is August uh, 2010 and that's Amir and I'm just starting to learn all about water just starting I'm a newbie so whatever I take whatever I see on the internet yeah I do that because you know Uncle Google and Professor YouTube that's these are my gurus all right so look at the size of his legs just look at him he's so skinny and look at his position um, we did at that point therapy in the water every single day, seven days a week. If I did it for 15 minutes, then it was 15 minutes. On good days, we were both having fun. I'd go as long as two hours. So look at the change in his body structure after, well, less than a year. Yeah, so you can really see, and we changed nothing else in our therapy except for the water. So you can see the muscles on the leg developing. You can see that alignment on his body. Uh, Fizzi, Here, same picture. Fizzi, I'm, I'm just to interrupt. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Time to go. We are, yeah, yeah, we are already. I'm, in. I will, yeah. Uh, yeah, please, okay. you can continue. All right, I'll do that. So I just want to show you, look at the body structure. Again, that's 10 years. Therapy was always the same, but it was the water that changed. He floats on his own. I'm trying to do this fast. Here is someone 18 years old. He walks with a walker. I want you to see him in the water. Nice body position there. This is a young boy with cerebral palsy. His mouth was always open, difficulty with speech. So we tried to use the snorkel to help him to close. His mouth is closed. That's 
a video and he was afraid of the water when he started with us. So here he is, very proud of himself too. Um, let me move slides. Independence in the water, the girl was actually using her arms to propel herself. She didn't need anything. So number of aquatic programs that I have taught. I've taught in various countries. 